bilingualism is an enriching element in society. And there, there's a tendency in America to believe, as in, unfortunately, many countries in the English-speaking world, that you can't serve two linguistic masters, that to be fluent in Navajo or French or Spanish is in some way to compromise your commitment to the English language and English culture. Historically, that isn't the case. That wasn't the case in the 19th century, and this is actually a fairly recent mentality, but it's a very destructive one, uh, if, if not only because a second language can be an important source of cultural identity, but because just from a purely practical way, in a global market in which other languages are not about to disappear, having a large and sophisticated multilingual population is an enormous advantage, as the Germans and most of the Europeans have discovered to the detriment of, 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 of the British or, or the Americans at this point. At the turn of the century, when there were four times as many people, in, in proportional terms, who spoke foreign languages as, as do now in the United States, most people weren't aware of the existence of large populations of foreign speakers unless they happened to live next door. Uh, nowadays, you can turn on your television set and see advertisements in Cantonese or Spanish or half a dozen other languages. You can drive down a highway and see billboards in those languages. You might uh, uh, pick up a product and see uh, product warnings in Spanish and French and so on and so forth. So I think most people have an exaggerated perception of how many speakers of foreign languages there really are. The vast proportion of immigrants recognize the importance of learning English and are learning English. 98% of Hispanics in Florida uh, indicated that they wanted their children to speak perfect English, a higher proportion, by the way, than, than for Anglos. So at the time of the American Revolution, there were a lot of people, like the lexicographer Noah Webster, like Jefferson, like Adams, who thought that Americans would naturally, in the course of things, come to speak a separate language, even as they would have a separate government and a separate culture. And the fact that that didn't happen wasn't determined really until the 1840s or 1850s. And the fact that now, the English, the Scots, the Irish, the Americans, the New Zealanders, and the Australians, all these people who speak English natively, continue to think of themselves as speaking the same language is by no means determined by the noises they make. After all, the Dutch and the Afrikan, Afrikaners, the uh, uh, Croats and the Serbs speak languages that are every bit as close, closer in many respects, uh, than the language that is spoken in, in London and, and San Francisco. So it requires a kind of positive decision. So one interesting question, is what will we be speaking in 100 or 200 years? Now, clearly, we will be speaking, um, unless there's some cataclysmic political event, we will be speaking a language that's descended from the language you and I are talking now. But will we think of it as English? Will my descendants, if I remain in this part of the world, and your descendants, if you remain in England, continue to think of themselves as speaking the same language? Not to mention the people who are using English in uh, the subcontinent in South Asia, in uh, the Caribbean, in uh, the South Pacific, and so on. That, that remains to be seen. It's an interesting question. The survival of English as a, as a series of noises is guaranteed. The survival of English as what Trollope called a unifying mental culture is much less certain.